It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how scarcity imposes demand on our cognitive capacity. In other words, on how the psychology that comes from not having enough demands attention and cognitive capacity and leaves us with less mind for other things. I want to include, um, I want to quickly mention scarcity of money, certainly, poverty, scarcity of time, scarcity of calories if you're dieting, uh, water, et cetera. And the argument is going to be then when you don't have enough of something, it captures your attention, it captures your mental capacity and leaves you with less. I'll, you'll see later how all this connects actually very nicely uh, with the talks we had before. We all know that attention is limited. One of the things that's interesting is that we fail to appreciate the extent to, to which it's limited. Many of you may have seen recent research on using cell phone in cars. We all know it's not so good, it's a disaster. It's, you know, basically compares to being legally drunk by US standards. Uh, this is a classroom in New Haven. It's a lovely study that was done where they uh, noticed that fifth graders in this class randomly assigned happened to find themselves either on the quiet side of the school or on the other side of the school where trains were going by. And so when you sit in the class and this train goes by, there should be a sound if you could hear it, that has an enormous distraction on kids' attentional capacity. And what they found is that the kids near the train tracks were one year in academic performance behind their friends on the other side of the school at fifth grade. Um, they then install, installed uh, soundproofing, and a, year, a couple years later, they were matched again. So this is just a passing train with an enormous impact. And the point is that these are trains in the external world. You don't need them to be in the external world. Imagine yourself in an office, very quiet, no distractions, except you're worried about paying rent, or a child who is sick, or anything else. Those internal trains are going to have an impact that could compare in terms of the attentional distraction and the cognitive capacity to having distractions on the outside. An amazing study that was done in the 40s had to do with when the Allied forces realized they were about to inherit a lot of hungry people in Europe, and they had no idea how to feed them. Feeding hungry people is a, is a non-trivial task. Uh, a famous researcher into nutrition in Minnesota conducted a, a series of studies. These are uh, conscientious objectors who, since they're objecting to the good war, were very eager to volunteer to these studies. These are capable young men who volunteer to starve, not to death, but to immense discomfort. And when you look at the descriptions of what happens, you know, there's the obvious physical stuff. They, they're too tired to keep their hands up to wash their hair. They need pillows to sit down because their butts are too naked. But the amazing stuff also is the psychological. These are young, talented men who spend their entire time planning to open restaurants, reading recipes, comparing prices of foods in different stores and in, in the newspapers. That's all they're thinking about. It's taking all their cognitive capacity. It's about food. At some point, the, the researchers decide to distract them by showing them some films. And you, these guys describe the films, and they couldn't care less about the love scenes. They want to see the meals. And what's important here is this is not something they're choosing to do. In a sense, they'd rather do something else. It just imposes itself on their minds, and it's very hard to avoid. So the notion is that cognitive capacity, which is a very limited resource, is captured by when you don't have enough of something, and you basically find yourself automatically paying a lot of mind to that thing you don't have. Now, um, a footnote, uh, if this works well, you should have these annoying blinks on the screen. If it was darker in here, it would be very annoying. Uh, these blinks that you're seeing last 350 milliseconds. That's how long you get darkness every time you blink. You blink approximately 15 times a minute. During the 12 hours that you're awake every day, you get one hour of nothing but dark input into your eyes, which you have never seen. That's to say that your brain is doing amazing stuff to which you have no introspective access. And that's sort of important because we walk around with this amazing machine and we think we know what it's doing. You know, we know it roughly like we know what our liver is doing, you know, unless you're a physician. And so basically, a lot of the behavioral research, and I'm saying this because it's very important when you get behavioral research not to do the, yeah, does it feel right to me or not? The argument is a lot of what we discover in behavioral research is about a mechanism that's magnificently sophisticated that's behind the eyes and between the ears to which you have very little access. I'm going to talk about particularly about poverty and a little bit about time, but again, the notion is that scarcity in food, friends, water will capture your attention in this way and be very profound. 
Nice studies have been shown, for example, that it's top of mind. So you get subjects into a laboratory who have been asked not to drink for four hours. They're now very thirsty. Half of them randomly assigned get water. The other half get pretzels. Not a good idea when you're thirsty. Then they sit in front of a computer and have to identify words. These are words that are flashing roughly as long as you had the blank. It's 400 milliseconds. And you have to decide, yes, it's a word or not, it's a word. And what you find is when you get words that are related to thirst, those who've had pretzels identify these words much faster than those who've had water. If you compare the performance to neutral words, they're identical. Again, this is, not at the level, this is pre-decisional, it's way too fast. It's literally showing that the words that are related to thirst have higher semantic activation. They're t literally top of mind. They're there to be tickled the minute anything happens that's relevant, as opposed to other words. And what the notion is that when it's top of mind, loneliness, for example, there's nice research showing, it's kind of a sad research, but it's very compelling. When you're very lonely, and loneliness is mentioned or brought up, you function less well, it's distracting. So the, the sort of tragic impact that loneliness has is that people are socially as capable as anybody else. When they think about loneliness, such as, for example, when you're interacting with somebody where it really matters to you to do well, that's when you do the least well because you, you have cognitive capacity taken by the concerns related to, to loneliness. Dieting and Cinnabons, very similar. Uh, here is a study we did in California. These are, this is a study done with dieters and non-dieters. We have them play fun word searches. You see these are words where the odd number of words are food related, cake, donut, sweets, and the, odd, the even number of words are neutral. There's two conditions, they get either this one or they get uh, the, another condition where now the food related words have been replaced by other irrelevant, neutral words. We're gonna have the dieters look and the non-dieters look for these, to find all these words. And what I'm gonna do now is look at how long it takes them to find the neutral words, the words that are common to both. So basically I'm asking, how long does it take you to find the word cloud when it's preceded by a donut or when it's preceded by a picture? And what you see is that the non-dieters, it makes no, no significant difference. The dieters take twice as long to find cloud having just seen a donut <laughs> than having just seen a neutral word. It literally interferes with what you do next. So it's top of mind, and when it's triggered, it sits there and it lingers and it takes cognitive capacity for what else you want to do. Financial poverty is the ultimate of all scarcities. We talk about a lot of other scarcities. It's important to keep in mind this is one that's non-discretionary. I'll talk briefly about the busy. You know, when you're very busy, you don't have time. We all talk about how busy we are. Don't tell anybody, but between us, if you stop doing what you're doing, nothing would happen, except for the few physicians in the room. But basically, it's discretionary. We choose to be busy. When you're poor, and we can get into interesting discussions about you know, what it is the minimum that you need and how that changes culturally, but when you don't have enough, when you can't pay rent, when you can't put food on the table, that's not discretionary and you can't take a break. When you're a dieter, there's really nice research on this, and you have a very important project this week, you say, you know what, this week I'll just do what I need to do, I'll go back to dieting next week. Notice you can't say, and I'll be rich this week, I'll go back to being poor next. <laughs> Not available, so it's a much more chronic, permanent, and imposing condition. And what we did in this case is we ran some studies in a mall in New Jersey. We go to people in the mall, ask them to participate, they sit in front of a computer, we give them classic cognitive tests that have been used in cognitive science for the last 30 or 40 years. One is a test of cognitive control, divided attention of sorts. So you sit in front of a computer, when you see heart, you have to quickly press the same side. When you see flower, you have to press the opposite side. You can, you can, you're getting a headache right away. It's confusing, it takes a lot of attention. The other, all of you have seen if you've done an SAT or GRE, or any kind of test. It's a classic test that's supposed to capture fluid intelligence. It's a major component of the IQ test basically which shape fits best in a missing space. So they sit and do these tests, and while they're doing these tests, we'll give them financial scenarios to contemplate. Your car breaks down, you have to think how you're gonna take care of it. In one condition, the non-menacing condition, the car's gonna cost $300 to fix. In the other condition, the challenging condition, it's gonna cost 1,500. As you're thinking about how you're gonna take care of the car, you do these, and then when you finish them, you tell us how you're gonna solve your financial problem. Okay? Finally, we'll get people's annual household income and divide them by basically splitting in half into rich and poor. Okay, so we know you're either rich and poor, we'll give you these problems, either a cheap car to take care of or an expensive car to take care of, and you do these uh, cognitive control and, and intelligence tests. 
What do you get? Let's look first at the rich. The rich, when they contemplate the easy or the difficult car, perform equally well in the cognitive control. Like it's like a driving test. The poor, when they contemplate the easy car, the one that they can easily afford, look exactly like the rich. But when they're thinking about a car that's hard to manage, that's hard to, to afford, they're now driving significantly less well. The cognitive control has diminished. Let's move to IQ. The rich are not impacted by what kind of car they're fixing while they're taking these cognitive tests. The poor, when they're, doing, when they're thinking about the car that's easy to take care of, look indistinguishable from the rich. But when they're poor, are worried about a car that's presenting a real financial challenge. They're performing here, we've done this now four different ways, replicated four times with financial incentives. They're losing the equivalent of 13 IQ points. So these are the same people who minutes ago when the car was manageable, performed just like the rich. Now that the car presents a serious imposition, takes a lot of mind, perform significantly less well on these IQ tests, on these uh, fluid intelligence tests. Um, we did all the controls we could in New Jersey, but these are, at the end of the day, different people. They're richer and less rich. They have had different education and have different heart rates and everything else. The dream was could we do this within subjects? The same person. It's not so easy to get people, you know, hundreds of them who are both rich and poor. But the third world does present cases like these, and this is the best one we found. These are sugarcane harvests uh, in outside Chennai in the fields in India. And the sugarcane is a particularly good case because you harvest only once a year. These are all people whose bulk of, bulk of their income is received only once a year. They're rich after the harvest. And because they're living relatively tight lives and have a hard time smoothing their consumption, they, end up, they find themselves poor before the harvest. So we run the same people now four months apart, two months before harvest and two months after harvest. A lot of nuances that make this very nice because the mills, because they're over capacity, they tell the farmer when to harvest, so the harvesters for over many months, we get rid of all kinds of month effects, et cetera. What you find, essentially, like in New Jersey, the same people sig score significantly less well on cognitive control and fluid intelligence tests before harvest when they're poor as, composed, as opposed to after harvest when they're rich. And now, of course, we've kept health, education, everything else intact. It's literally a function of whether you have enough or not and how much cognitive capacity that takes from you as you're trying to do these stupid tests. Um, time, I'll spend less time today on time, but many of us, many of you are time poor in ways that are not completely different from the way that our subjects in India and New Jersey are money poor. You have to think trade-offs, you have to borrow from, today, from tomorrow to do things you haven't had time to do today at high interest, etc. cetera. Um, what we did here is run, uh, these are Princeton students. Nobody would blame them for being myopic. They're highly educated. They're very sophisticated. We have them play a game, a classic, many of you know Family Feud. It's a game where they're trying to get the answers. They're very eager to do well. The performance gets translated into payoff. And we make them randomly either time rich or time poor. So you either have 50 seconds per round or 15 seconds per round, which is not quite enough. And in some conditions, you cannot borrow. So when you're out of time, you have to move to the next round. In other cases, we allow you to borrow. We offer you payday loans, basically predatory lending rates. You can borrow at high rates. So every second you take now, you have two seconds less left at the end of the game. We look at how they do. What happens? Uh, there's two measures. There's rounds completed and points earned. I'm not going into the details. This is what you see when there's no ability to borrow. So when you cannot borrow, notice the rich obviously play more rounds and get more points because they're rich. They're playing more games. Now I'm going to let you borrow. Now, if you run out of time, if you want to, you can take more seconds. The rich notice, um, this should come on at a time. Maybe I don't have it. The rich notice there is no impact at all. There is high interest borrowing available. Do I want to borrow? I look and I say, no, it's not really useful. It's not really worth it. I'm not doing it. The poor, same Princeton students, just with less money are dying to get this right, are running out of time, are focused on what they're doing right now, the periphery gets less mind, and they borrow. And they run out of time too quickly, and they, score, and they leave the experiment with substantially less money. So we're basically seeing the sophisticated Princeton students taking payday loans of the kind that we typically claim the poor are doing out of lack of insight and intelligence. It looks very much not a function of who the person is, but the context you put them in that makes them act poor 
in ways that minutes earlier in the mall, in the fields of Chennai, in, this, in the Princeton lab, you avoided if you were just a bit richer. Implications, we all need to take policy, uh, uh, bandwidth a lot more seriously. We have a very limited mind when it's devoted to some areas, and in poverty it's a massive one that never leaves us alone. There is just less mind to pay attention to other things. And policymakers typically don't think this way. So you saw Phil's uh, FAFSA application. Think about a poor person who comes for some benefits program. Imagine I propose, let's charge them $300 to join. You'd say to me, wait, they, they have no money. They're coming for help. Why would you charge them money? Well, they also don't have bandwidth. And when we charge them massive bandwidth to attend all kinds of events at the right hour and fill out complicated forms and do all the things that they exactly are what they don't have enough of, namely bandwidth and attentional resources, we're kind of doing the wrong policies. So uh, Phil's FAFSA, beautiful study that you saw, is one example where you basically could alleviate some bandwidth uh, limitations. A lot of work has been done on defaulting workers into retirement savings as opposed to expecting them to do it on their own. That has a big effect among people who are too busy. And in healthcare, there's a massive effect. So this is a glow cap. A glow cap is a $12 plastic bottle that delivers you medication. And it's structured that, so that if it's not open at the right time, it blips and blings and sends you an email saying, I haven't been opened in time. And it turns out there's some estimates in the third world where HIV is one case where you can't just take 60% of the time, you have to take all of it, all the time. Some estimates that $12 glow cap is having a two decade life expectancy impact. And clearly it's a case where people want to take it, they intend to take it, but bandwidth is limited and they forget. And so if you take that more seriously, there's an enormous amount you can do. Uh, last thought, I'll leave you just a picture that might stay in your mind. In aviation, it's become very clear very early on that you can't train pilots any better. That's all they can do. As avionics get more complicated, it's up to you to design more sophisticated cockpits. And the argument here is if you look at people managing their poverty, their scarcity in different resources, it's up to us, policymakers and others, to design basically a cockpit, a life that's more manageable given severely limited resources. Okay, I'll stop here.